Thanks very much, uh, and thanks um, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak here. I'm very honored to, uh, to be here at the Memorial Conference for Vladimir. I, I, uh, I wish that I had known him better. Uh, I, we, we met and I had certainly talked to him sometimes, but I feel like I didn't have as much opportunity as I would have liked to get to know him and talk with him mathematically. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the subject uh, of uh, elementary infinity toposes, uh, which uh, is a fairly new thing uh, that we've just really started looking at, um, this definition and what we can do with it. Uh, so in one sense, there isn't a whole lot maybe to say about it, uh, but I wanna use this opportunity also to, um, to talk about and to, uh, to bring out and emphasize a, a particular uh, contribution of Vavadsky's, which I think is often uh, not emphasized as much as it should be, especially in comparison to other things like uh, univalence. Uh, and uh, this, uh, Dan, Dan Grayson already told us on Tuesday that Al Vladimir himself actually said that his main accomplishment was not univalence, but rather um, the definition of H levels here that I've copied from his uh, foundations library. Uh, contractibility and uh, the, the, the H levels starting at contractibility and moving up through propositions and sets and groupoids and so on. I don't actually remember or know whether uh, Vladimir would have included the definition of equivalences here, but I would certainly include it as part of this really important contribution. Um, so why do you think, why, why, would, why would he consider this and why would we consider this such a great accomplishment? I, we'll get back, we'll get back to it, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not expecting you to understand this at the moment. Um, so whatever it is, um, it's a few lines of code, <laughs> really. Why, why is this uh, more, why could this be more important than univillains, which everybody talks about and is really useful for all sorts of things? Well, um, to try to explain that, let me try to let me go back and, and go over a little bit of history and sort of where things are, where, where things were at the point when, uh, this, when, when Vladimir did this. So the, the, the um, univalent or the, the homotopy interpretation at least of, of type theory and higher categorical type theory um, really sort of goes back more than 20 years to uh, Hoffman and Stryker's paper on the groupoid interpretation. Uh, which was, and they presented their model uh, in groupoids, in ordinary one groupoids, not sort of higher groupoids, as a, uh, essentially a counterexample to the provability of uniqueness of identity proofs. Uh, uniqueness of identity proofs is a principle that says that any two in, in elements in an identity type are equal, are related by another identity uh, type. Uh, and so people sort of expected this to be true when they were thinking about types as being like sets. Uh, and uh, this was the first model to show that that is not provable because there are also models where types are groupoids. But at the end uh, of this comment here, they, uh, they say that this also justifies a view of propositional equality in type theory as a notion of isomorphism. So they're, they're pointing towards univalence here. Um, the idea of uh, the tower of H levels uh, goes back at least um, to the people working on higher category theory uh, John Baez and Jim Dolan and, and that group. This here, they're talk here's, here's John talking about um, uh, categ categories, but um, later uh, uh, it was realized that groupoids um, are sometimes more convenient to work with. So um, he says, if you have objects of an n category, then their Homs space between them is an n minus one category, and then Homs between any of those two morphisms is an n minus two category, and so on. And then he pushes this down further uh, to into lower dimensions. So if you have parallel n morphisms in an n category or parallel uh, or, or objects of a set, for instance, uh, if n equals zero, then the Homs between them is a, should be a minus one category, uh, which means, and, and what, what, do you, what do you have if you have two elements of a set? Well, either they, they could be equal or they could not be equal. So it's really just a, a truth value, a proposition. Uh, so the minus one categories are the truth values uh, and John is thinking of classical logic, so he says they're just two of them, true and false. Uh, constructively, there would be however many there are. Um, and then if you go down one further more, then any two proofs of a truth value are, are considered the same, uh, so there's only one minus two category. So this, this is the, the idea of H levels, uh, which Vladimir gave the, de the formal definition of in type theory, and he shifted, Vladimir shifted it up a couple numbers, so it starts at zero instead of minus two, uh, but I think most people have stuck with the minus two, even though it's a little bit awkward. Do you know exactly what that refers to? I don't know. Um, that, uh, uh, yeah, I don't actually. Um, I, I, I would suspect probably 
not at first. Uh, there, there was a lot of independent parallel development of these things going on. Uh, and here's some more, more parallel development because um, Vladimir uh, uh, came up with the idea of the homotopy interpretation on his own. Uh, but it was at the same time, the same idea, um, uh, Steve Audi and Michael Warren wrote this paper, and this, their, their preprint was up in 2007, uh, interpreting type theory into uh, Quillen model categories. Uh, and they mentioned the possibility of practical applications to proof assistance and that uh, dependent types correspond to vibrations, as uh, uh, Andre Jarrell mentioned in his uh, uh, description, and the identity type should be a path object and so on. Um, so these ideas of, of the, the homotopy interpretation of type theory, the higher categorical structure, were, um, were floating, all floating around. And moreover, the idea of univalence was also floating around already too. Uh, so if you go to back to the Hoffman Stryker paper and you look at the very end of it, um, they suggest to make an extension of type theory, so adding some principles to it, that takes account of this fact that propositional equality is isomorphism. And that's, this, is, this is essentially univalence. So they define this type of isomorphisms, uh, a map in both directions, an F and a G, and then homotopies or, or equalities relating to the identity. And they say if you have a universe of discrete groupoids, so sets basically, and then uh, this type of isomorphisms is isomorphic to the identity type of that universe. And it's definable in one direction and you postulate an inverse in the other direction. And they call this universe extensionality. Uh, by analogy with function extensionality. Uh, perhaps an even better word would be type extensionality because it's saying that types are extensional. We, we, we identify the identity types in the, uh, the type of types in the same way that we do the type of functions. Um, so this is really literally the univalence axiom. It, it's even expressed in exactly the same way. We define one direction of the isomorphism and then the other direction is postulated uh, as an axiom. Uh, and the only thing that's missing really is that their definition of isomorphism only works in that case of the universe of discrete groupoids. Um, in fact, uh, if, you, if you try to write down their notion of universe extensionality uh, using this definition of isomorphism and you have two nested universes that both satisfy that property, then that's inconsistent. You can prove false. Uh, this is an exercise in the, in the homotopy type theory book. I don't want to go into the details of exactly how that proof works, uh, but uh, intuitively, the, here's, here's a description of the idea. So um, if I peel off the F in front here, then what's left, the G and the two homotopies, are what you might call a proof that F is an isomorphism, or the witness that F is an isomorphism. And if we um, uh, restrict to the case of uh, when F is the identity map on a type A, then what is this? Um, so G compose F is just G. And F composed G is also just G when F is the identity map. And so what the data here we have is an, an endomorphism of A together with two homotopies relating it to the identity map. And if you think about that homotopically or categorically, you've got the identity map, which is like a base point, And then you have a G, which is another map. And you have two paths relating them. And together, those form a loop. So there's some non-trivial homotopy going on in this, this structure. And that's not really what we want. We want something to just be an, an, an isomorphism or an, or an uh, equivalence. Okay. So just um, to, to sort of emphasize even further sort of where we were and what we knew and what was puzzling to us, uh, this is a snippet from a conversation on the N Category Cafe blog in December 2009. Uh, I believe I certainly was not aware of Havatsky's work at this time. I don't think either of the others were either. Um, so John suggests that uh, mathematics should be founded on infinity categories uh, with sets as a special case, the same way that we end up doing it in univalent foundations. And I mentioned this idea of intentional type theory because I, I was aware of, uh, I don't remember exactly whether I had read uh, Steve's and Steve Audi and Michael Warren's paper at that point, but I certainly knew about um, Peter Lumstein uh, and uh, ben Benno Vandenberg and Garner, Richard Garner had been uh, proving things about uh, the groupoid structure of types. Uh, and uh, this idea that we would reduce to ordinary set theory when we restrict to the infinity groupoids where all Hom spaces are empty or contractible. So this, the, the sets being found inside the higher types. Uh, and then Peter said, well, yeah, that's, that's a nice idea, but asking a Hom set to be contractible involves arbitrarily high dimensions. Because you think about contractibility for an infinity groupoid, you have all the higher homotopy groups that have to vanish. And it's not clear what kind of language that you talk about that. Uh, it seemed to him at that time, and, 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 and to me too, uh, that a type in type theory could have higher dimensional structure. This is the fault of the right. Because it's a finite dimensional complex, and you truly think of connected calculus and homology as being compressed. It's a finite process, and you think you can do it. Well, there are infinitely many homology groups. Huh? There are infinitely many homology groups, too. What? There are infinitely many homology yeah. groups, too. No, no, but if it's finite dimensional, there are only finitely many that can be compressed at all. So um, specific well, 
Well, not, I mean, okay, so there are certainly specific cases. Sure, uh, but it's not always in the I didn't say that it was. I, no. I, I mean, I, I, but the, the point that I'm making is that this is actually wrong entirely, right? So it's, it's not even just that it's wrong in some cases, but it's always wrong. Um, it But we, 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 I mean, so the, the okay, this is, this is a conversation to happen afterwards, right? Um, I mean, this is, this is a statement about type theory. It's not a statement about classical homotopy theory, right? So in, in the statement is, the, the, the question is how in the finitary syntax of type theory, you, right. could, you could describe something like contractibility, right? So at this point, nobody had any, you have no idea what that means in type theory to say that it's finite dimensional or to, or to talk about homology at this point. At this point. Right. Okay. That, yeah. So, so um, the, for the point I'm trying to make is that uh, um, Blavatsky's definition of contractibility and equivalence is, is so simple expressed inside of type theory, but it tells us all of this higher structure. Right? And, and even wh wh whether it's uh, in, a, in a particular case of a finite complex, you can do homology calculations or whatever, but it's all encapsulated in this um, few symbols description of contractibility. Right, so, uh, so we've had um, a few people talking about syntax of type theory. So the, the sigma type uh, means a type, a, de a dependent sum type. So an element of this type consists of an X that is an element of A together with an element of this pi, and then the, the pi is the type of dependent functions, so that means that it, it's a function, an element of this pi is a function which assigns to every element y an, an element of the identity type from x to y. <coughs> so uh, so this, the, I learned about the Vladimir's work in February 2010, so two months after this conversation, uh, and uh, we, were, we all came, uh, Steve Audi invited me to, to come hear Vladimir talk, and there was, I remember it's especially because there was a blizzard that trapped us all there for several extra days. Uh, I drove back to, uh, to, I eventually drove back to Chicago because all the planes had been canceled, and I believe Vladimir drove back to Princeton from through the blizzard. Uh, and I remember that after we heard Vladimir talk, so he presented his ideas and uh, he, uh, uh, he showed us his cock code, including that, um, that snippet that I showed you earlier, uh, and we were all excited, not, not just about univalence, but especially about this definition of equivalence. Um, so uh, this uh, the notion of equivalence says, uh, if I want to you know, parse this here, it says that for this is a function assigning to every point in the base uh, a witness of this sort of contractibility of this type, which is the homotopy fiber of the map over F. So an element of this is a point of A together with a path from F of that point to Y. So it's saying the homotopy fiber is contractible for every point in the base, and the type of equivalences is the uh, type of functions which are equivalences in this sense. Uh, and uh, the reason we were excited about this definition, uh, well, at first it seems unintuitive if you look at it the wrong way. So, um, and I remember Vladimir saying uh, that it took him a long time to be able to come up with a definition like this that would work. Uh, and nowadays, it seems obvious, uh, but uh, at the time, to, to some of us at least, it was not obvious at all, because it from, so from the standard propositions of type, types point of view, this here says that a is a singleton type. It says there's a point of A such that ev for every element of other element y of A, x is equal to y. Okay, um, but in the homotopical interpretation, uh, if you think about it the wrong way, it seems to say there is a point x such that every other point y is connected to x by a path, which sounds like it's saying this type is connected, not that it's contractible. Okay. Uh, that's wrong, and the reason it's wrong is because everything in type theory is represented by something whether it, that, that's continuous, if it's like topological or functorial, if it's you're thinking in, in terms of groupoids and categories. And so this pi type, the elements of it are functions uh, that assign to every y a path, but they have to assign that path continuously or functorially. So it actually gives you a contracting homotopy that these paths vary continuously with y, and it does make it the whole thing be contracted. There is, but it's actually easier to state contractibility than it is to state connectedness. So to, to state connectedness, you have to somehow break this continuity. 
And uh, one way to do it is, uh, I'm not gonna talk about this, is, is to, to, to propositionally truncate this identity type. So instead of saying, having a function that assigns to every y a path, you have a function which assigns to every y a proof that there exists a path. Uh, so the, the, the propositional truncation of this is sort of the, the, the proposition of that a proof that there exists such a thing. And then if you state it that way, then it, you get connectedness instead of contractibility. Um, so this was Vladimir's definition of equivalence, which is sort of the first correct one. Uh, nowadays, we know various other ways to do it, which are also correct. So this, this top one is one that uh, uh, Emily mentioned yesterday in a different context, where instead of having one map backwards with two exhibit homotopies exhibiting it as a left and right inverse, you have two maps backward, one of which is a left inverse and the other of which is a right inverse. And if you think about it topologically, instead of having a, a loop like this with one point up at the top, now you have two points up at the top, each of them connected to the base point by a path and you can just contract them down instead of having a loop which goes around and has non-trivial homotopy. Uh, another thing, thing that you can do is instead, in addition to G and these two homotopies, you can add an extra higher homotopy which is like filling in the circle with a disk. And once again, you get something contractible. And there are other ways to do it as well. But, but, uh, but, but the harder part was coming up with the first definition uh, which Vladimir did and afterwards it was easier to think of other ways to do it. So how do we know that this definition is right? Well, um, Vladimir showed that it holds in, his simpl in the simplicial model and we've since found a few other models, other models in which it holds. Uh, and he also showed inside of type theory that this type of being equivalent to it is a proposition or a, a minus one category, a minus one group wide. So it just contains only the information that F is an equivalence without any extra homotopical data. So this is his code, uh, is a prop, is his being of H level one, uh, which in the, the categorical indexing being means being a minus one, a homotopy minus one type. Uh, so this is one another way that we can tell that this is correct. Uh, so what I wanna talk about for today uh, in elementary infinity toposes, I haven't had anything about those yet. Uh, it's another perspective on this uh, correctness of this definition uh, and uh, a subject that is made possible essentially by having a correct definition of this sort and other similar things that follow from it, okay? <coughs> so elementary infinity toposes, um, what is an elementary infinity topos? Well, first of all, what is an elementary topos is the first question, uh, if we're not familiar with that. So this is the one categorical version. Um, so this, the history of this goes back to the, the 1960s. Um, so Bill of Air realized somewhere in around 1964 that um, the, uh, um, the basic rules of set theory, uh, like in ZFC, can be expressed as properties of the category of sets and functions. Uh, and the reason, that, uh, one reason that that's interesting is that there are lots of other categories that we can study, and a lot of them share many of the properties of the category of sets. Uh, so uh, in particular, Grothendieck's uh, sheaf toposes, which he introduced in order to study cohomology, uh, actually uh, later in the, in the 60s, Lovera and, and Miles Turney realized that these categories satisfy almost all of the same properties of the category of sets. Um, essentially everything except the law of excluded middle, uh, the axiom of choice, and sort of this well-pointedness. Um, these fail in the category of sheaves because uh, sort of roughly speaking, open sets need not have open complements. Uh, locally surjective maps of sheaves need not have sections, and uh, a map of sheaves is not detected on its global sections. So these properties all fail, but other than that, sheaves of sets behave very much like uh, ordinary sets. Uh, and so what that means is that if we have some proof in mathematics, which we can code up into set theory, we can also code it up into the category of sets, and as long as it doesn't use these extra properties, then uh, it's, uh, it can be coded up into other categories as well. Um, so this is not uh, the real definition, but I'm saying that a topos is a category with all the finitary properties of the category set except for those. And uh, what, why finitary? Uh, well, the, the, the motivation is to make it uh, elementary, which is a technical sort of logical model theoretic term. Uh, another word is first order. Uh, the idea is that it's supposed to be described by a set of syntactic axioms like ZFC. Uh, rather than by invoking some external set theory so that we can, so, so, so an example of a non-finitary property is uh, infinite coproducts exist because you, that way you need an external notion of set in order to index your coproducts by. But we want sort of only finitary ones so that we can talk about it as a formal theory analogous to ZFC. So why is this useful to have this notion of category uh, that behaves like a category of sets? Well, on the one hand, it lets us um, 
do mathematics inside of a category like that. So if we have, as I said, if we have some proof which doesn't use these, these classicality properties, we can interpret it in arbitrary categories and then get theorems for free, essentially. Um, not in the, in the sense of uh, Bill Wadler, but in, in the categorical sense, right? So uh, for instance, if you prove some theorem about rings, and you didn't use any of these properties, then your theorem is automatically also true about sheaves of rings. You don't have to work explicitly with the sheaves. So this is the, the, the idea of internal languages. Uh, and uh, I think it's a little bit underappreciated probably because a lot of mathematicians um, are a little bit wary of formal logic, but I, th I think it's growing in, in, in appreciation. Uh, we can also go the other direction. If what we're interested in is logic, uh, then we want to- sh to a generator, one that actually has a name. Uh, this one down here? Uh, th that's the gener generator means that maps out of that object detect equality in maps. So uh, two maps, two maps of sheaves need not be e equal if they agree on global elements. Good point. But that's really essentially irrelevant to interpreting the logic internally. Um, so going in the other direction, if we have, uh, if we're logicians and we care about things like independence proofs. If I have some statement like the continual hypothesis and I want to know whether it's provable from the axioms of set theory, a good way to show that it isn't is to construct a model in which it's false. And these sheaves, these sheaf topos is given us a nice way to do that. So if we can build a, a, a corresponding sheaf topos, then inside the world of that category that we can show that the continual hypothesis is false. And uh, this is essentially a different categorical or geometric way of thinking about the forcing technology that set theorists use. I'm not going to say any more about that. Um, so here's a more precise definition of an elementary topos. It's a category with finite limits, finite colimits, exponentials, and a subobject classifier. Uh, these are all representability properties. So pr finite limits are saying that certain functors are representable. Uh, exponentials, meaning that it's Cartesian closed. There's some, some functor like this is representable. That's what a, uh, an exponential is. A subobject classifier, I'll talk more about that later. But it says that the functor taking every object to its set of subobjects is representable. Um, this definition is redundant. Uh, you can remove some of these axioms and still get uh, an equivalent definition. Uh, but I like to include them because uh, when we generalize to the higher dimensional case or to predicative cases or other things like that, it's less obvious at least that it's similarly redundant. So we should start with a definition that we know is correct and only later remove things as we discover the, from it that they're redundant. <coughs> uh, and the last thing I want to say about um, elementary tuplesers is that uh, there's a, a theorem which is sometimes called the fundamental theorem of topos theory that the slice categories of elementary toposes are also elementary toposes. So the slice category over X, its objects are arrows into X with arbitrary domain and its morphisms are commutative triangles. And the reason this is important is that in mathematics, if we we're trying to internalize sort of lots of mathematics and do it inside this category. And uh, a lot of times in mathematics, we don't just talk about sets, but we talk about sets of sets or families of sets. And if we're doing it in ZF-like set theory, we can just have sets whose elements are other sets. And so we can do operations sort of element-wise on the elements of those sets. But in a category, you can't talk about an object of a category whose elements are other objects of the category. That doesn't make any, make any sense. Um, so what we do instead is we talk about morphisms. Uh, an, an, or, an arrow from A to X, we regard as an X-indexed family of sets or family of objects where the fibers, in some intuitive sense, right, in an arbitrary uh, category, we don't necessarily have fibers in, 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 in any explicit sense. Uh, we think about the fibers of this as being the sets that are being indexed. And so if we want to sort of do things element-wise like we did up here, uh, we want to do it fiber-wise over here. So the fiber product, the pullback of A and B over X is sort of taking the product of each fiber of A with the corresponding fiber of B. So in order to be able to do th all these sorts of things fiber-wise, we want the slice category over X to have all the same structure that the category E does. So that's why it's important that this theorem is true. Uh, in particular, the slice categories are Cartesian closed because E is, they have exponentials. So E is called locally Cartesian closed. We have these exponential objects over X. And this is equivalent to saying that these, that pullback functors from between slice categories have right adjoints, which are sometimes denoted by pi sub F uh, because they correspond to these pi types in the, uh, the, the type theory. So you can say, you can, the way you can think about this is, is saying that the, the pi along here is, the, its elements, quote unquote, are functions uh, mapping each fiber of F to the, the, uh, the corresponding fiber of some element over X, uh, Y, so some, uh, some family over Y. The left adjoint of this functor it always exists as composition with F, and that corresponds to the sigma types uh, that pair up an element of Y with an element of the corresponding fiber. <coughs> so that's what I wanted to say about elementary toposes. Um, 
moving towards the higher dimensions, so why, are we, why would we be interested from a logical sort of encoding of mathematics perspective, why would we be interested in higher dimensions? Well, uh, it, let's start by talking about that subobject classifier that I mentioned before. So uh, a subobject classifier is a representing object for the functor, which takes every element, every object to the set of isomorphism classes of monomorphisms into that object. So we regard these this as sort of a subobject of X, uh, a monomorphism, and two monomorphisms that are isomorphic over X represent the same subset or the same subobject. This gives us a functor to set, uh, and uh, a, a subobject classifier is, which we've assumed to exist in a, in a, in a topos, uh, is a representing object for this. So that means that every subobject of X is classified by a unique map from X into the subobject classifier omega. Uh, so there's a universal subobject of, of omega. Its domain turns out to be the terminal object, uh, which pulls back uh, to classify arbitrary subobjects. And in the category of sets, this is the set of truth values. So in, in classical logic, there are just two of them. It's a two-element set. And this, is th this universal property is talking about characteristic functions. Every subject, subset has a characteristic function that picks out um, true or false based on whether an element is in that subset. Um, so it it's, it, this is a sort of a logical notion, but it also characters geometric information. So in the topos of sheaves on a space, this omega is the sheaf of open subsets of, a, of, of uh, the space X. Um. <coughs> now, why is this useful in this sort of internal logic perspective? Well, um, it lets us talk internally about the collections of propositions or the collections of truth values. And because we have internal exponential objects, we can also talk about uh, characteristic functions maps into this subobject classifier, and therefore we can talk about subsets internally. And of course, in mathematics, we use subsets a lot. So here's just one example of how we use subsets, where one way to define the real numbers uh, is as Dedekind sections in the rational numbers, and the Dedekind section is a subset of the rational numbers. So in order to define the set of real numbers, we want to talk about the set of subsets of the rational numbers. So we need this, this notion of internal subset, uh, what's called a power object. Uh, and uh, if we do this construction in something like the topos of sheaves on a topological space, then what we get out is, is a sheaf of continuous real valued functions on that space. So this logical construction interpreted internally in this sheaf topos, just using the fact that this sheaf topos acts like the category of sets, automatically gives us something of geometric interest, uh, the sheaf of real valued functions. Um, so this is great um, for doing mathematics that involves subsets, but if we also want to talk about families of sets, uh, as I was talking about when we talked about sort of slice categories and so on, then uh, we, it's not enough to have a subobject classifier. We want something which classifies more objects that aren't necessarily subobjects, families that aren't necessarily monomorphisms. Okay. Um, so you might, the first thing you might try if you're um, a little bit being a little bit naive about this is to say, well, let's just remove the, the assumption that these mo things are monomorphisms here. Okay, um, so we'll just talk about objects of the slice category, take the isomorphism classes of that, uh, and that gives us another function to set, and we could ask for a representing object for that. Uh, and uh, if you're familiar with sort of homotopy theory and higher category theory, then you probably can guess that this is not really a very good definition. Uh, it does, things like this do occasionally exist, but not, not very often, and they're not very useful when they do, uh, essentially because we've thrown away too much information by squashing out the isomorphism. So in general, uh, as soon as things can be isomorphic in more than one way, it's pass through isomorphism classes often loses too much information. So that wasn't a problem back here because two monomorphisms into X can only be isomorphic in one way uh, because that's the property of a monomorphism. But when we talk about arbitrary families, they have a, can have automorphisms that are non-trivial. And so we lose too much information if we squash them out to a set of isomorphism classes. Um, you might think, well, we should keep all the, the, the morphisms in this slice category. Uh, and uh, you can try to do that, and it, but it turns out to be a lot more subtle. Uh, so it's easier to just stick with keeping the isomorphisms and, and, and not worry yet about the, the morphisms between them. So let's consider the functor which sends every object X to the maximal subgroupoid of this slice category. So the objects and all the isomorphisms between them. And then we can ask for a representing object for that. Now that's all well and good, but if an object is going to represent a functor that maps into groupoids, then the HOM sets into this object have to be not just sets but groupoids. And of course, if the HOM sets are, of E are groupoids, that means E has to be a two category rather than a category. Uh, and if E is a two category, then that means its slice category is also a two category. 
And so this functor actually lands in two groupoids. And now if u is going to represent a functor landing in two groupoids, that means that this HOM set here has to be a two groupoid. And that means that E itself has to be a three category. Uh, and, and sort of we're off and running. And eventually we end up at infinity. Right? Um, so uh, Emily talked a little bit about infinity categories and infinity one categories yesterday. Uh, and we only, uh, we, we don't, we don't uh, because we're sticking to looking at isomorphisms, we don't need infinity and infinity categories. We only need the infinity one case that Emily was talking about where everything above level one is invertible. Uh, and this is sort of the world of uh, homotopy theory, which, and em Emily talked about these analytic presentations and the quasi categories or res spaces. Um, other ways to present them include vibration categories, like the tribes that Andre Jal was talking about uh, in his talk, uh, quill and model categories. Um, and then there are also the synthetic type approaches that Emily talked about um, with uh, her work with Dom and uh, with me. Uh, I'd love to be able to say everything that I'm going to say today in these synthetic approaches, but the, the, it hasn't been written in that language yet. Uh, most of what people have done in, in, in higher topos theory has been in these analytic approaches. So I'll just, I'll be one of those people who says infinity one category and tries to not worry about what it means. But if I'm pressed, I'll probably say, well, it's a quasi category because that's what people have used so far. Uh, but uh, this, so this is a, a goal, I guess, is to, to do all these sort of things synthetically as well. <coughs> so um, the, um, remember that we had two different kinds of one toposes. We had the Grotendieck sort, the toposes of sheaves, and then we had the more general Lovert-Tierney elementary kind, uh, which include Grotendieck's but also other examples. Um, so the, the Grotendieck analog uh, in the infinity one world is pretty well known by now for the past 10 years or so and more or more. Uh, and uh, Jacob Lurie has probably been one of the most um, prolific and uh, visible expositors of, uh, and, and uh, researchers in this field, uh, although there were other people who contributed to the ideas as well. Um, so, it, and it, I'm not going to give a definition, uh, but basically you just sort of stick infinity one on everything. You have to be a little bit careful how you do that. So this, this notion of sheaf is rather more general than you might think uh, the, uh, if you just sort of generalize things naively, um, but I'm not going to want to get there. Um, the point is that we've got this some definition, and there's a characterization of it due to Jacob Lurie and Charles Rest, uh, that uh, if it being an infinity one topos uh, is equivalent to saying, first of all, that you're locally presentable, and this is a non-elementary condition. Uh, basically, it says that you have a set, a small set of generating objects, and you have well-behaved uh, infinite colimits. Uh, and then it has these more elementary conditions. It's locally Cartesian closed, so its slice categories have exponentials in the appropriate infinity one sense. And it has sufficiently many object classifiers. Right? So what do I mean by sufficiently many? Right? Back here, I defined an object classifier to be representing objects to this functor. But actually, we can't actually take that as a definition, because if we try to represent all the objects, we end up in Russell-like paradoxes. Right, so in, in, like in set theory, we can have a set of all subsets of a given set, but we can't have a set of all sets. That sort of gives us problems. So instead, um, instead of asking it to represent this entire functor, uh, we ask it to be sort of a subfunct, this representable functor to be a subfunctor of this. So we say we have a map from e, the, maps in the, 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 the space of maps into U into this groupoid, which is an embedding, or it's, a, it's an equivalence onto a union of connected components. So what that means is that not every family over X is classified by a map from X into U. But for those that are classified by such a map, uh, the isomorphisms, the automorphisms between such things correspond equivalently to homotopies between maps into U. So you can't have all the homotopies? That's basically the idea, yeah. It's not, a, it doesn't determine the, you know, the object classifier. That's right. That's, that's just one of the more difficult things in ge this generalization, that a given object classifier is not determined uniquely by a universal property until you fix the class of things it, it classifies. So this, is, this was his point. Like if you say, I want to classify all the arrows whose fibers have cardinality less than kappa for some regular cardinal kappa, then that characterizes you uniquely. Um, and that's essentially what we're doing, what, what, what it goes into this, this characterization. Yes? That's equivalent. That's an, I think that's equivalent to this definition. Yeah, because so this um, uh, the, Oneida, the Oneida lemma says that uh, a map, uh, a natural transformation from here to here is determined by uh, an object in the slice category over U. And then the fact that this map here is an embedding tells you that that map is univalent. 
and conversely, if you have a univalent fibration, then pulling back that fibration along maps into U defines such a transformation, and it's an embedding because the fibration is univalent. But this is, the reason I, I read it like this, this is, uh, corresponds more directly to uh, the notion of subobject classifier and sort of the categorical topos theoretic approach, and this is the definition that's used in the higher topos theory as well. But I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to that characterization a little bit later as well. So, so this is what is meant in their characterization, that it sufficiently many object classifiers means for regular cardinals kappa, you have a classifier for these objects with fibers bounded in size by kappa, whatever that means, that I don't want to get into. Okay. So, so just like the uh, definition of elementary topos uh, has a sub-object classifier, the definition of an infinity one topos involves an object classifier. So let's try to extract the finitary part of that definition of that structure of these infinity one toposes. So it's got lots of stuff which is basically the same as in the, in the one categorical case. It's got finite limits, finite co-limits, in the homotopy infinity sense, of course, everything is in the homotopy infinity sense. It's got uh, exponentials, it's got, it's locally Cartesian closed, so it has exponentials and slice categories as well. It has a sub-object classifier, uh, so it, it, that actually classifies all sub-objects, uh, but it, it, and it has enough object classifiers in this sense. Now, um, in saying, th saying it the way Lurie and Resk did is not elementary, it's not finitary because it talks about regular cardinals. But and what we can do instead is we can ask that um, for every morphism, uh, for every family of objects a uh, uh, over X, there's some object classifier which classifies this morphism. Uh, and we want this thing to be big enough. So we'll say that, it's that, that the, morph the, the class of morphisms that it classifies is closed under this other extra structure. So this is uh, essentially a categorical way of talking about universes in the type theoretic sense, right? So a universe, uh, the elements of a universe in type theory are not all types, but they're some collection of small types which are closed under sigmas and pi's and so on, right? The, the sigma of something in the universe over something else in the universe is also lies in the same universe and the so on and so on, okay? Uh, <coughs> so, yes? You take their coproduct. If you have two families and you want them both to be classified by the same, you take their coproduct and, and classify that. Um, so, in a sense, this is not really uh, a radical definition, right? You sort of just take the infinity one topos and you have you know what an elementary topos is and you sort of extract this out. I mean, this 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 thing. There's maybe it's a little bit of room to debate about exactly what you mean by enough object classifiers. Um, the real question is whether this definition is good enough to let us encode mathematics because the, the whole point of the elementary one topos axioms was that they're just like the category of sets and so we can sort of do mathematics inside uh, an elementary topos. So the question is, is this good enough to be able to do the kind of mathematics that we'd want to be able to do, sort of homotopical higher categorical mathematics inside an elementary infinity one topos in this sense? And uh, uh, I think the, there are some reasons to worry uh, and the reason to worry is the contrast between this word here finitary and this symbol here, infinity, right? Uh, because when you get to infinity categories, lots of things that used to be finite categorical constructions now become infinite categorical constructions because you have infinitely many dimensions of cells to talk about in your category. So something like splitting idempotents. In a one category, splitting an idempotent is a finite limit um, and being an idempotent is a finite thing. But in an infinity category, even being an idempotent involves infinitely much data. Because, so an idempotent is a map F such that F squared is equal to F. Uh, but in an infinity category, you, instead of equal, you say you have a homotopy from F squared to F. And once that homotopy is data, then you can use it to construct two different homotopies from F cubed to F. And you'd like to say that those are the same to have a coherent notion of idempotent. And then you can use that homotopy to construct two different higher homotopies between homotopies from F to the fourth to F and, and so on all the way up. Right, so being an idempotent involves infinitely much data. Splitting an idempotent involves an infinite limit um, or, or, or co-limit. Um, the quotient of an equivalence relation is a very simple thing in set theory, but in higher category theory, it involves infinitely much stuff because you want to, uh, if you have X and Y that are related by your equivalence relation, you want to glue in a homotopy from X to Y. But then if you also glue in a homotopy from Y to Z and from X to Z, those, that triangle should commute. So you have to glue in a higher cell and then you get tetrahedra and so on. So it's an infinite limit, infinite co-limit. 
uh, the, the image of amorphism, well, one, one straightforward way to construct the image of amorphism is to take its kernel and then take the quotient of the kernel. So in other words, to, uh, to mod out the domain by the equivalence relation induced by the map. Uh, but that again, that's, in, that's the, now the infinity kernel is a, a, a simplicial object which is infinitely many things and then its co-limits geometric realization is an infinite thing, okay? So it's not obvious that we can do these things in an elementary infinity topos whose structure is only finitary. And that would be a problem because we want to be able to do homotopy theory inside of a, a, this elementary infinity topos. It's actually even worse than that um, because uh, the very notion of infinity one category is sort of not finitary and, and this, um, these axioms that I wrote down, I mean, de depending on how you write them down, they might even, they might look infinitary too, right? So having finite products is an equivalence of infinity group voids and one way to understand that is that it's talking about an equivalence of homotopy groups at all dimensions or of cells at all dimensions and that's again, that's not a finite statement. Um, for most of the, in most of the cases, this is not a real big problem because there are different ways to do it, so, to deal with it. So you could express this notion of equivalence in a more finitary way. Uh, one way to do it is, would be to use a synthetic theory of infinity categories where you have a basic, as, em as Emily mentioned, like an adjunction or an equivalence can be detected in the homotopy two category uh, of these things. Uh, another way to do it would be to use a categorical presentation with one categories like vibration categories or Quillen model categories where you have strict universal properties that you can express in a one categorical way which nevertheless yield these higher categorical versions uh, as well. Um, I don't want to get into the details of that. The, the point I want to make is that it's trickier for the object classifiers because the universal property involves a subgroup void of the category E rather than its HOM group voids. So we're sort of working at the, 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 the level of the entire category uh, and there are sort of infinitely many cells there that we have to say something about. And this is where um, we get to what uh, Andre was saying, we're pointing out about it, this equivalence to the notion of univalent vibration. Uh, and so here is an, uh, an essential, uh, here's a sketch of how we could solve that problem by essentially reducing it to saying something about the universal case. Right. So uh, there's a universal object for an object classifier. So the Yoneda lemma says uh, when I have a map like this, uh, right, it's determined by an element in this category, this, in this pre-sheaf over U. So it, I have a, some specified universal object of the slice category over U uh, and I'm calling that U1. Uh, and now uh, if I have a couple of maps which, uh, into U which classify some the, the pullback of, this, of this, uh, this map in the slice category over X and we want a way to say that uh, HOMs between F and G, uh, so this is the, the, the space of homotopies between F and G should be equivalent to the space of isomorphisms or equivalences between these uh, objects of the slice category. Um, and uh, so this is a categorical way of, of saying this, is to say, well, to give a homotopy between F and G, this is the same as, uh, to say that two maps are equal, is the same as this to say that when you pair them up and map into U cross U, that factors through the diagonal. So that's true in, uh, literally in, in a one category, uh, in a higher category, factoring through the diagonal is, is structure rather than a property and sort of such structure corresponds equivalently to giving a homotopy from, from, from F to G. Um, so in a sense, this, this U, uh, this diagonal map here is the classifier of homotopies. Uh, in, in, uh, in a model categorical perspective, it would be the path object. Uh, the path object is sort of a fibrant replacement of the diagonal. Uh, so if we could construct uh, another object which classifies equivalences so that lifting F comma G to E corresponds to equivalences over X, then uh, we could say that these two things are equivalent by saying that it's in the representable case that U is equivalent to E uh, over uh, U cross U. And we can almost get there because local Cartesian closure gives us an object that classifies arrows. So I didn't go, I, I didn't say exactly what, uh, how we construct something like this from local Cartesian closure, but uh, essentially local Cartesian closure says that I can have representing objects for uh, morphism. And so in, in a, a Cartesian closed category, I have an object that represents arrows, uh, maps into it corresponds to uh, adjunctively to arrows and the same thing is true locally here. So I can build this object F so that lifting um, F comma G to this object F corresponds to giving a morphism between their pullbacks. So all we need to do is we need to somehow cut out a subobject of equivalences from this object F. Okay. So another way to say that is if we have a map in some slice category, we'd like to form the subset of all indices who's such that the fiber of G the, over this map is an equivalence. 
So this is a natural thing that we'd want to be able to do more generally in doing homotopical mathematics inside of uh, a category. Uh, and a categorical way to say that is to ask whether some, some subfunctor of this representable functor is itself representable. So this, this representable functor, its elements are maps into x. I'll consider the subclass of maps, such maps, such that when we pull g back, we get an equivalent. So that's uh, an intuitive way of saying that sort of f, uh, the image of f lands inside the indices over which g is an equivalent. Okay, so is this subfunctor a representable functor representable? And can we build such a representing object using the finitary structure of uh, an elementary infinity topos? And in a one topos, or in a, in a locally Cartesian closed one category, yes, because uh, we, can we, can, we can first build this local exponential, uh, which to gives us, classifies morphisms in the opposite direction from B to A. And then we can take a couple of equalizers uh, of this, uh, of maps out of this uh, classifying object. Uh, to construct a new object which classifies maps backward whose two composites with this thing on both sides are, are identity. And, and since the universes are unique, uh, we get uh, a monomorphism into X. Okay. Now, this is, this is exactly a categorical version of the Hoffman Stryker definition of isomorphism. We're giving a map backwards in the other direction and two equalities uh, between the two composites. Uh, and so it turns out to be wrong to do just that in an infinity one category because for, the, for exactly the same reasons. Uh, if we do the same thing, equipping some, we equip something with a homotopy inverse and it ends up, if that's not just a property, it's extra structure. And so this induced map here is not a monomorphism and it doesn't represent the right functor. Okay. Um, and we can try to make it monomorphism by adding higher coherences, but then it's no longer finitary. Right? Uh, now, this is the problem that's solved by the coherent notion of equivalence that Vladimir gave us and those other ones that we came up with later uh, as well. Uh, so if we take his definition, so this is, this is, his, this is the, uh, the Cox code representing that um, the sigma pi giving an element and then a contracting homotopy as I described before. Uh, if we translate this definition into category theory, it gives us a construction of this, this EG. So we take the DAG, start with the diagonal over um, the fiber product of A with B. We take the, the pi, uh, the, the right adjoint to pull back along this projection. So that's this pi up here. We, we compose with G itself. So we take sigma of G, the left adjoint to pull back along this map. That's this sigma here. And then we take the pi, the right adjoint to pull back along the projection from B to X. And that's this pi here. And that gives us an element in the slice over x, an object in the slice over x, which is this classifier that we're looking for. Okay, so um, essentially what this, do, we, this gives us this equivalence classifier. And so that gives us a, an elementary or finitary way to express the, the object classifier in terms of this univalent vibration. So this univalent, essentially saying that this E is equivalent to the diagonal, as I propose, is, is, is an equivalent way of saying that this vibration is univalent. And this is was Vladimir's goal, essentially, in introducing this definition is do, to do, doing this inside the type theory rather than in a category to be able to express the univalence axiom. So as a property of a universe inside of type theory is this univalence axiom says that equalities or paths are equivalent to equivalences, but he had to give a coherent definition of equivalence in order to make that make sense, to make that consistent. Uh, and then the paths are uh, uh, a type theoretic version, a vibration version of the diagonal. Okay, so, so this is why, this is the connection between these two things that I was saying, right? So we're interested in doing infinity one toposes. Uh, in order to be able to do this stuff finitarily, we need these finitary constructions of things like equivalences. And that's what we got from the type theory uh, approach that, that Vladimir was doing. Um, so that's why, that's one of the reasons that I think that, that was such an important innovation. All right. So let me finish by saying a little bit about where this theory of elementary infinity toposes is and where it's going. Um, so uh, Vladimir's construction uh, and these other constructions of equivalences are really good for talking about equivalences and contractibility, but there are these lots of these other infinitary constructions we'd like to be able to do with, to deal with. So like, remember I, I mentioned uh, item potence and uh, quotients of equivalence relations and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, one way to try to deal with these infinitary things is to include some infinity internally inside the category that's represented in some sort of finitary way externally. So there's a nice uh, way to, to, to do that by talking about something called a natural numbers object. Uh, 
in, in the one categorical case uh, or essentially the same thing in the equivalence cat or the infinity case. Um, so what is the defining property of the natural numbers? Uh, they have zero and they have a successor map uh, and they're sort of freely generated by zero and successor. So they're an initial object in the category of objects equipped with such morphisms. Uh, and the, the maps out of the initial object are basically saying that we can define functions by recursion on the natural numbers uniquely. Uh, and so this is, this, is, this is a finitary property uh, of an object. If you, have, if you have a category that has a countable coproduct of copies of the terminal object, then that countable coproduct is a natural numbers object in this sense, but then the converse is not true. Being a, a, a natural numbers object is sort of a finitary elementary condition which doesn't necessarily imply that it's externally a coproduct. Uh, this is not included in the basic definition of elementary one topos. Uh, so elementary toposes include sort of totally finitary ones, like the category of finite sets is an elementary topos, and it doesn't have a natural numbers object. But, but often when you start to encode mathematics in a topos, you find that you need natural numbers objects. So there are a lot of theorems that begin, let E be a natural, uh, 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 an elementary topos with a natural numbers object. Uh, so it's not, it's not unreasonable to add it as, uh, as well. Uh, and even in, um, in an infinity case, uh, there's a, it, because we have sort of infinite, infinite many dimensions, we, we sort of expect to need a natural numbers object even more than otherwise, Other, oh, more than the, in the one categorical case. So you might think maybe we should add it to, even just add it to the definition, but fortunately we don't need to. Um, that is already, we already know that that's redundant. Uh, so essentially from the higher dimensional structure, we can extract this infinitary uh, set level structure. Here's a, there are, here's a sketch of a proof. Um, so we have, uh, we assume by assumption we have an object classifier that contains the terminal object or classifies the terminal object and is closed under finite coproducts. So this thing is already infinite in some intuitive sense because it, it, it has a one element set and a two element set and a three element set and so on. So but somehow we just need to pull out the, the, these things, okay? Um, so one thing we could try to, we could do is we could define, we could sort of just close up under these coproducts and sort of throw away everything else. So we can define the smallest subobject of U that contains one and is closed under finite coproducts. So this is somehow, this is a classifier of finite sets. This isn't quite what we want though because it, that still contains all the automorphisms of the finite sets. So this is sort of an internal version of the coproduct of the classifying spaces of the symmetric groups, essentially. Uh, so what we, need to, all we, what we need to do is we need to equip our finite sets with extra structure which makes them rigid so that they don't have any automorphisms anymore. So uh, this, is, this is a sketch so I'm not saying exactly how we do this but so we can using this, the, 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 all the extra structure of a topos, we can build a classifier of totally ordered objects uh, and then find the smallest subobject of that containing one enclosed under finite coproducts and totally ordered finite sets are rigid. They don't have any automorphisms. So this is, this, all this, this, these classifying spaces go away and we get a set and a zero type. And then we can prove the Peano axioms which imply that it's a natural numbers object. Um, and th th if you get the induction axiom, uh, we use its definition as the smallest subobject such that so-and-so. That's essentially what induction says. That if you, can, you contain one and you're closed into successors or zero and closed into successors, then um, you're at everything. <coughs> okay, so we have a natural numbers object and then we can use a natural numbers object uh, to solve a bunch of these other problems that I mentioned. Okay, so it turns out that uh, if we have one extra datum uh, in an incoherent idempotent, then we can split it uh, by an internal construction using this uh, natural numbers object. So this is, uh, I wrote this down sort of uh, in this context, but I was inspired by an external construction that, that Jacob Lurie gave. Um, Nikolai Krauss and, and uh, Floris van Duren and Egbert Reike have shown independently that we can construct images of morphisms in this way uh, and uh, quotients of equivalence relations. Uh, and Egbert has also shown that we can construct truncations into n, n group voids for all n. And he's even defined a notion of equivalence, uh, of, of higher equivalence relation that you can construct a quotient of. Uh, and there, uh, Nima Rafik has shown that um, you can get local Cartesian closure once you know that uh, you, you have the internal full subcategory and the object classifier. So I don't want to say exactly what that means, but it's, it's kind of an analog of how in, in one topos theory, you don't end to assume Cartesian closure, but you can get it from the power object. So this is sort of a similar thing. <laughs> That's the next slide. <laughs> Thank you for waiting to ask that question until I was ready. Um, so the reason that I've got quotes here around theorem and the reason I've got quotes here around show is that all of these theorems are not actually proven in infinity one categorical language. They're proven in type theory. Okay. Um, and 
so the, uh, remember I said that, that the idea of the, the topos theory, the elementary topos is, is that there should be a way to interpret mathematics inside of a category, and there's a formal way to do that. Um, so we can do it informally by saying, I'm do working with sets of sets, I'm gonna translate that into families of the uh, morphisms over X, I can do it by hand, but there's a formal way to do it as well, um, which is uh, to write down a formal system called type theory, uh, and then make a correspondence between the structure of type theory and the structure of the category. Right? So the objects in the slice category correspond to dependent types. Uh, in, you, may be used to, you may have expected me to say fibrations over here, and so it depends a little bit on the model. If you're talking about tribes or fibration categories, then uh, you would have fibrations over here, but once you're in the infinity one world, everything is equivalent to a fibration, so it doesn't matter. Uh, and I already mentioned that the dependent function type, the pi type, corresponds to this right adjoint to pullback. Finite colimits correspond to non-recursive higher inductive types. I haven't said anything about higher inductive types yet, but, um, and I won't, uh, but, but there they are. And the object classifiers correspond to univalent universes. So there's this correspondence here, and if we've written something in mathematics or in type theory, one thing I can do is sort of look at it and sort of manually translate across this um, equivalence, so this, this correspondence. Um, or I can do something that, uh, uh, and, uh, that's sort of wa hand wavy and say, well, I'm just gonna regard this type theoretic notation as notation for categories. So when I write x colon x turnstile a of x colon type, I mean that a is, a, is, is, a, is an object of the slice category over x. Uh, and that, that sort of thing works up to a point, but when you start to write longer arguments, then it becomes hard to, to defend that sort of abuse of notation and, and less feasible to do the translation manually. So these arguments here, some of them are, are longer and some of them are shorter. They're sort of maybe in an intermediate um, world, but uh, when you get to, to some things like, say, the, the Fight-Thompson theorem, which has recently been formalized in type theory in talk, uh, which was a many, many, many years project with many, many, many people working on it, and there are thousands and thousands of lines of code, and you wanna say, I'm just gonna regard that as notation for working in an infinity category, then, I don't know, not everybody believes you. Um, <coughs> so, uh, the, the way that we do this formally is we, we prove what's called an initiality principle. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the way to say this uh, is that um, we, we take the type theory of the formal language and we build a category out of it, which is the, sort of the, the universal model or the term model or the, the, the Lindenbaum algebra. And it's in different contexts, this has, has uh, different names. Um, and then we prove that that thing is the initial category with some structure. <coughs> Okay, so whether it's the initial elementary topos or the initial <coughs> infinity one topos or whatever it is. <coughs> um, excuse me. <coughs> and this initiality principle automatically gives us the results like soundness and completeness. So soundness is a statement that if we can prove something in the type theory, then it's also true in any other category. And that's what we really need here to get rid of these quotes. We need to be able to say if we prove something in type theory, we can interpret it in a category. And the way we do this, once we have initiality, is we just build it, do it in type theory. Because the initial category is built out of the formal syntax, then it's the, what we did is, is true by definition there, and then we apply the, this functor, this unique functor, out of the initial object to anything else, and that tells us that it's true anywhere else as well. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, any sufficiently structured category. Sorry, yes? There's actually a mistake in that paper. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in communication with him and, and we're, we're trying to fix it, but um, <laughs> that, thank you, <laughs> yeah. Right, so, so you, you, for every kind of type theory, there's a corresponding kind of category. Uh, and uh, you could imagine uh, having a general machine which would take a type theory and produce a kind of category, but that doesn't exist yet, really. Um, uh, so, but but the, this correspondence uh, exists in many particular cases, we can figure out what it should be. So um, it, elementary toposes correspond to something called higher order um, intuitionistic type theory. Actually, just stay back over here. Um, and uh, like Cartesian closed categories correspond to simply typed lambda calculus and so on. Uh, 
And uh, the way we prove these initiality theorems uh, is just by inducting over the syntax. So syntax is constructed inductively by sticking things together uh, and we just induct over that and then uh, we define this unique map out of the initial object uh, piece by piece on every piece of syntax. Okay. Um, so why is the, what's the big deal? Um, why is this something that Vladimir spent a lot of time and effort working on uh, towards the end of his life? Well, there are some issues. So um, I said it's just a straightforward induction over syntax, but if you have a large and complicated type theory like homotopy type theory, there are a lot of cases in that induction and, and, and no one has actually written them all down. Um, so we all sort of believe that it should be possible, but no one's actually done it. Um, and there's also a qualitative difference in difficulty for dependent type theories. Uh, and I think this, uh, there's a question asked uh, uh, a couple days ago about uh, why this isn't just, just like ordinary model theory. And I think this is the real reason that dependent type theory is harder because it mixes the types with the morphisms, with the terms, with the equalities. You can't, so in, in ordinary t simple type theory, non-dependent type theories, you can first induct over the types and then induct over the terms and then induct over the equalities. But with dependent type theory, it's all mixed up. Uh, and there's, as far as I know, there's still only, still the case that only one person has ever written down anything approaching a complete proof of initiality for any dependent type theory at all. Uh, so opinions differ about how important this is or whether it's completely straightforward or whether we should worry about it, how much effort we should put into it. And I'm not, I don't want to take any stance on how important this is, but there's one other piece which is indisputably important, which is strictification. So um, the, uh, the, 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 the type theory, uh, Operations in type theory often happen very strictly up to definitional equality, uh, and that corresponds directly to a categorical structure which is very strict. Um, it's like the, the tribes that uh, Andre Jal was talking about, uh, where we have a, a one category with strict pullbacks of vibrations and so on, but it's actually even stricter than that. The strict pullbacks are strictly associative, uh, and, and various other things are strictly preserved by pullback. Um, so there's a step of strictification. If I give you an infinity one category, which where everything is defined up to homotopy, somehow you need to either replace it by some equivalent strict presentation, uh, or you need to somehow show that your strict syntax is also initial in the world of, of weak infinity things. And this is something we only know how to do in a few particular cases. So this is, this is essentially one of the big open problems in elementary infinity topos theory, um, is, is making, this, making this work in all cases. So this is my last slide. Uh, I think I ran a few minutes over. Uh, so this is one of the open problems is actually proving this internal language correspondence. Uh, part of that is constructing the initial object. Uh, so showing that that category of syntax is actually an elementary infinity topos in this sense. And it's not as, as, as obvious as you might think because the, the, what you build out of the syntax is naturally one of these strict one categories. So you have to somehow take a, uh, uh, the homotopy infinity category that it presents and show that it has properties. Um, we don't actually know whether there are any uh, <laughs> other than the, the, the Grodendieck ones. I mean, the, the Grodendieck ones are already interesting enough, but, but as far as I know, no one has actually constructed one of, uh, or sort of categorified one of the non-Grodendieck elementary one toposes yet. Um, I didn't say anything about higher inductive types, but the, uh, the finite colimits correspond to the non-recursive ones, uh, and we don't really know quite exactly what the recursive ones correspond to. Uh, and I, this is a question that I think is really interesting. Um, we don't know what a logical functor should be between infinity one toposes. So a logical functor between one toposes is one that preserves all the, the topos structure. So it preserves the limits and the colimits and the, the exponentials and the subobject classifier. Um, but as was pointed out, uh, the object classifiers don't have a universal property. So I can't talk about the object classifier. And so I can't say what it means for a functor to preserve the object classifier. So this is another interesting question, um, what this definition should be. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>